I'm Dr. Fakir Avadi and this is Upper Respiratory Tract Infections in Adults. Respiratory tract infections are generally divided into upper and lower. Upper respiratory tract infections include common cold, otitis, pharyngitis, and rhinosinusitis. The paranasal sinuses are four paired air-filled spaces located between the orbits and below the anterior cranial fossa and they are frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoid sinus, and sphenoid sinus. And just like the rest of the respiratory tract, these sinuses are actually lined with ciliated secretory respiratory mucosa. Now, these sinuses actually drain through narrow ostia, which are uh, several um, millimeters in diameter and are actually prone to obstruction when the mucosal lining swells in response to viral infections, uh, for example, or environmental irritation. Rhinosinusitis is typically caused by inflammation and mucociliary dysfunction from either viral infections uh, or allergies. There can be increased mucus um, production as well as reduced clearance, which can lead to obstruction of the sinus ostia, which creates a great environment for bacteria to grow. As a result, the immune response will uh, cause inflammation and there can be damage to the host local def defenses, which can actually further uh, promote growth of organisms. Risk factors for rhinosinusitis is uh, allergic rhinitis, nasal polyps, which, which can also cause obstruction, asthma, cystic fibrosis and immunodeficiency, as well as environmental um, factors. Now, occasionally rhinosinusitis can result in complications, and the site of these complications include the orbits, so the eyes, and also the nervous system. And that makes sense because these are in proximity to the sinuses. So if the infection gets complicated, it can actually, the organism can actually penetrate the eye and also the, the brain. When it comes to pharyngitis, the mechanism is actually not well understood. It's proposed that alterations to the host immunity actually allows for organisms to grow in the pharynx. Although pharyngitis um, for the most part occurs in children aged 5 to 15, it can also occur in adults, especially in parents of school aged children because pharyngitis is contagious. Let's take a look at some reliable resources. So we do have a 2012 IDSA guideline for acute bacterial sinusitis. We also have a 2012 IDSA guideline for group A streptococcal uh, pharyngitis. There's also a 2015 guideline uh, for sinusitis from AAO HNS, which uh, we will not talk about in this uh, topic. And there are also guidance available from the American College of Physicians and the CDC on acute respiratory tract infection in adults. The first learning objective is distinguish between rhinosinusitis, pharyngitis, and other acute respiratory illnesses using patient-specific factors, clinical manifestations, and diagnostic testing. Rhinosinusitis is inflammation of the paranasal sinuses. In acute sinusitis, the symptoms last less than four weeks, whereas in chronic sinusitis, the symptoms are beyond three months. And in between that, you have subacute rhinosinusitis. Now, if you have rhinosinusitis due to bacteria, we call that acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And of course, if it's due to viruses, we call it acute viral rhinosinusitis. And then we have acute pharyngitis, which is primarily sore throat that usually lasts one week. There's also acute bronchitis, which is the productive or non-productive cough that lasts up to six weeks. There's the common cold, which is a mild upper respiratory viral illness that usually comes with uh, sneezing and rhinorrhea. And of course, we have allergic rhinitis, which is a non-infectious uh, immunoglobulin-mediated reaction against inhaled allergens. The symptoms of acute rhinosinitis include nasal congestion and purulent uh, nasal discharge. And if you keep in mind the anatomy of the sinuses, um, you'll see that these patients can also have maxillary tooth pain, facial pain, or pressure. And of course, these patients can also have fever, fatigue, cough, hyposmia, or anosmia, which is basically uh, reduced about, uh, ability to smell or the lack of ability to smell. Uh, they, they can also have ear pressure or fullness, headache, and um, halitosis. 
Symptoms usually um, last between a day up to 33 days, depending on what's the underlying cause. And what's important to note is that 85% of patients actually can have uh, at least reduction or sometimes uh, even resolution of symptoms within 7 to 15 days, especially if these are uh, viral um, viral infections. And that's without antibiotic therapy. So, so in studies where uh, the groups were um, receiving placebo, they actually had a high percentage of patients actually have resolution of symptoms. Now, when it comes to acute pharyngitis, there's a triad of sore throat, fever, and pharyngeal inflammation that are the hallmark of acute pharyngitis. And this sore throat is worse with uh, swallowing. The pharyngeal inflammation is characterized by erythema and edema, and it usually lasts for one week. For the, from the IDSA guidelines for rhinosinusitis, uh, for diagnosis of rhinosinusitis, they have major symptoms and they have minor symptoms and their um, criteria is that uh, a patient must have uh, at least two major criteria uh, in order to be diagnosed or they can have one major plus uh, two or more minor symptoms in order to have a diagnosis of rhinosinusitis. Now gram stain and culture uh, from the sinus puncture is not routinely done because uh, it's invasive, time-consuming, and uh, perhaps uh, painful for the patients. Now it's important that if you use this uh, criteria to diagnose the patient, uh, it doesn't really distinguish between whether it's bacterial or viral infection, so that also needs to be determined. So th here are the criteria that IDSA has set to uh, distinguish between bacterial and viral. So if the patient meets any of these three criteria, uh, there's a good, sus um, you know, you can um, suspect bacterial uh, rhinosinusitis. So one is if the patient has persistent symptoms or signs compatible with acute rhinosinusitis uh, for at least 10 days. And that's because viral infections typically result by day 10, whereas bacterial infections typically persist uh, through um, 10 days. Now, before the 10 days, if the patient has severe symptoms or sign of, uh, signs of high fever, so 39 degrees uh, centigrade or higher, and purulent uh, nasal discharge or facial pain lasting for at least 3 to 4, four consecutive days, that's suggestive of bacterial uh, in, uh, infection. As well as if the patient has the double sickening. So if the patient um, was initially improving and then followed by uh, worsening, uh, that's referred to as double sickening or double worsening and basically the first part of it was due to viruses and the second part is due to bacterial uh, growth. So that's also suggestive of bacterial rhinosinusitis. Now acute pharyngitis can also have complications and those include uh, peritonsal or abscess, uh, cervical lymphadenitis, mastoiditis and possibly other invasive infections. So these are the uh, structures that are around the pharynx, uh, so if the bacteria can uh, potentially affect those areas. Now, these IDSA guidelines are specifically for, for group A streptococcus, specifically streptococcus pyogenes, and it's uh, important to note that uh, overall, um, there's a small percentage of patients with pharyngitis that have group A strep uh, pharyngitis. So in adults, it's about 5 to 15 percent uh, who have um, uh, strep, uh, strep throat, and more so in children. And the reason this is important is because uh, strep pharyngitis can actually lead to acute rheumatic fever, um, you know, uh, especially in children, less so in, in adults. It can also lead to post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So treatment of strep throat is uh, important. Now here are the IDSA um, criteria for distinguishing between group A streptococcal pharyngitis and viral pharyngitis. So the most important is, uh, you know, absence of fever suggests that it's a viral pharyngitis, whereas if you do have fever uh, as part of the um, triad, uh, it's more suggestive of group A streptococcal pharyngitis. Now, if you use this criteria, uh, you know, it's more suggestive. It doesn't really confirm. So if someone has fever, uh, it still needs to be confirmed uh, by bacteriologic um, uh, culture. So what they do is that 
you actually uh, swab the throat or, or the clinician will uh, do a, a swab of the throat and do a rapid antigen test for, for group A streptococcus. So if this test uh, positive, then the patient will be diagnosed with group A strep pharyngitis. And now where it, if it turns out to be negative, there's no need for confirmation in adults because um, because there's a low incidence of uh, group A strep pharyngitis in adults. Now in children, um, you know, it is recommended to confirm it if it's negative. Now because strep pharyngitis is contagious, uh, you might think that, uh, you know, if somebody gets it, you should test uh, all of the household members, but that's actually not recommended.